agriculturalists, as an animal, we've been doing agriculture for 11,000 years. If we went back 11,000 years in time, that would be past this wall and up the drive and across the field and all the way up to the road. And back then was when people first started saving seed and everybody's since then has been improving on the works of their ancestors. So each person saved seed of the very best plant, which was best for their soil or their taste or their culture's way of preparing the food. And they passed them on to their children and women would pass it on to their daughters and men would pass it on to their sons. And each generation would save the seed that did best for them and so improve on the work of thousands of years of generations following them. And if you come back, coming forward in time, by the time you get to the Bronze Age, which is maybe at the start of the car park, we've had all the major empires by then, and all the you know, major big developments, and most vegetables have been domesticated. Most varieties we have now have been bred by then in one form or another. Um, there's very little more recent than that being added to the stuff that we eat. And then you come up to the modern day, and if on this scale, if, if here is now, on this scale I'm talking about, we get to about there, and we suddenly invent a hybrid seed. And at that point, we say, well, we're not going to improve anything anymore. We're going to stick with what we've got. And this really brings me to hybrid seed. So, and that is tied in with the seed legislation thing, because one of the ways that you can achieve very uniform seed in order to meet these requirements is by developing hybrid seed. Now, seed companies love hybrid seed because nobody else knows what the parents are, so only the seed company can produce it. Um, you can't save your own seed because you don't know what the parents are. And if you try and save seed from a hybrid plant, you'll get this whole mishmash of different shapes and very few of the plants will actually be any good. Um, and the reason for this is that hybrid seed is from two different parents that have very poor inbred parents. You've got one that's a really bad parent here and one really bad parent there. And you cross them to make your F1 hybrid and all the bad genes in this plant, well, you've got bad genes in this plant as well, but they're not the same bad genes. And so the offspring gets one copy from each parent. And the bad genes in one are made up for by the ones that are okay in the other. It's really unlikely that it will get two bad copies because these these bad, inbred, runty, little weedy parents, they're quite separate in ancestry. And so your F1 plant has got at least one good copy. And the way that things biologically work on this planet is if you've got one good copy, you're okay. So these F1 plants grow really well. And this is where this myth of hybrid vigor comes from. This is your hybrid plant and it's really vigorous but it's no better than an ordinary plant would be. It's physically impossible. I'm a plant geneticist. It's not possible for a hybrid to be better than an open pollinated variety. The reason hybrids are vigorous is because the open pollinated varieties haven't been maintained properly. It's a lot of work to maintain an open pollinated variety properly. You have to inspect every plant and check it throughout its life cycle. Make sure that you take out any that are sick, take out any that aren't vigorous, check them for flavor, maybe even test them in different environments and different soils, and then create a breeding population. But with our vegetables, we somehow seem to have decided that this is not a way of doing it. So by contrast with the hybrids, you take one plant, and it can be as runty and horrible as you like, and you just like keep one plant, don't pay any attention to it, just inbreed it, you don't have to main a big population. You just keep a small handful of plants going for generation after generation after generation. You're the same with another different plant to provide the other parent. It's very little work. When you put them together, like I said, the bad genes in one are made up for by the good genes in the other. Now, the thing is, this has lots of really big implications. If we take this F1 hybrid plant and try and produce seed from it, it has got loads and loads and loads of bad genes in it. They're just masked by the good one it got from the other parent in each case. When it selfs, they all sort out randomly and you don't get one good and one bad in each case. You get lots of bad, lots of good, lots of bad, all for thousands and thousands of different genes. So you might find if you save seed from a hybrid squash that you end up with little tiny bitter things like that. 
great big mushy things like this, things that come early, things that die as soon as it rains on them, because you've got this random reassortment of all these hundreds of thousands of bad genes in the inbred parents. And I don't believe it's any sort of great conspiracy on behalf of the seed companies. But actually, it's very convenient, because unless you have ownership of those two parents, or even know what they are, you can't recreate that variety. That variety will be very uniform. Every F1 hybrid seed is a clone of every other F1 hybrid seed. They're all genetically identical. And this comes to another point about our thing of, I talked about, how we've evolved in time and saving seed year after year, you're adding to all your ancestors' achievements of increasing what we have to eat as a species. And hybrid seed stops that dead in its tracks because every hybrid seed is absolutely identical of a particular variety. Genetically, they're all the same. So there are two problems with this. First of all, there's a problem to do with variation in space. So we take all these absolutely identical seeds and we plant them in different fields and different climates and different soils all over Europe or all over the world. And all these identical seeds will produce really well, but only if they're in absolutely identical growing conditions. So we then use lots of fossil fuels to create identical growing conditions with soil amendments, crushed rock, Maybe we put plastic over the soil to heat it up. We do lots of tillage, spraying, if it's conventional agriculture. Organic agriculture can be very oil intensive as well. And it's really a lot of it is to provide a standardized growing medium for these standardized seeds. So we have no variation in space with hybrid seeds. And there'll be a real problem when we don't have the oil available anymore to have this very energy intensive agriculture and we have to go back to growing vegetables in a diverse set of environments and diverse soils and different agricultural setups but we haven't got the energy to kind of mangle it all into a standardized situation for the plants to grow in but there's another problem with the hybrid seeds is we've not only frozen plant development in space but we've frozen it in time because we're using these same inbred parents and we're using them every year to make the same identical F1 hybrid seed. So if you have a package of a particular F1 hybrid from 1980, it is genetically identical to the packet of the same hybrid. Now, 20, 30 years later, every seed is still the same. So not only have we lost the ability to adapt our vegetables to different areas as agriculture spreads and changes and historically agriculture has gone out to some areas and then come back as population has expanded and contracted and society has changed the way that it organized itself but we've also stopped our development of these plants dead in time because the seed is the same year after year after year so if the climate changes which appears to be very, very likely we could have sudden catastrophic climate change or slow gentle climate change, but the climate will change. We have no genetic variation over time to adapt our crops. And this is crazy. This is what we eat. We're organisms that consume food to stay alive. And we need to be a little more concerned about this. Um, so we've got this huge, just millions and millions and millions of people's accumulated knowledge and effort and it's it's an inheritance that's been passed down from every human being for the past 11,000 years coming up to now and this is all these amazing vegetable varieties that have all been developed by people who just kept ones that grew well and tasted great because the people who didn't do that starved to death and didn't reproduce so you know we've evolved with all these vegetable varieties they're part of our heritage as human beings and now suddenly we're saying oh actually Forget about that, that's stupid. We're just gonna like make a few that we can make money with and we're just gonna plant these forever and use loads of fossil fuels to make it happen and mark it and don't worry.
But the thing of uniformity for supermarkets is just really, really insane. There's no need for that. It's just the consumers have been trained to expect unblemished food and to reject anything else. Um, I'm not even really sure why that's happened. Um, it's almost like a bit of a arms war that has got out of out of hand in arms race that has got out of hand between different suppliers. You know, you can have two people you can buy my lovely tomatoes, buy my lovely tomatoes. Everybody's buying their tomatoes, and someone says, "Buy my lovely tomatoes." They're all a tiny bit bigger, and human beings are just really stupid. Eventually everybody ends up buying the big ones and then people start breeding big ones even though they taste nasty and because everybody's used to buying big ones they buy big ones even though they taste nasty. And the guy who's got the small ones that taste fantastic goes out of business and then we've only got big nasty tomatoes to eat. I'm not sure it's a conspiracy so much as just human beings are actually quite stupid primates and I don't think we're very good at things that should be really obvious. So for the farmer, for the industrial farmer, supplying the industrial food industry of course it makes sense. Use hybrids. All these things make sense in the short term, in the immediate term, in the now. But they're just unbelievably stupid, idiotic. If you look, you don't have to look very far ahead. Even 10, 20 years ahead, there's going to be no oil for anything on a massive scale in 30 years time. And where will the seeds be then? Who will have the seeds that can grow without it? Supermarket is the absolute epitome of the entire problem that we're talking about. So just stop going to the supermarket. You shouldn't be in the supermarket. If you're thinking about these issues, why are you in a supermarket? You know, you should have moved beyond that point by now.